Good afternoon. I'm Wendy Sims Moten calling to order the Board of Education regular board meeting October Tuesday, October the 11th. Um, are there any public comments for closed session? We can't see you from back there. Yeah. <laughs> She's there. We just can't see her. Okay. Thank you. Hearing that there's no um, uh, public comment for closed session, we will adjourn to closed session to discuss items C1, 2, 3, and 4. Thank you. Good evening. It is 601 and we have concluded a closed session this evening we did not take any action in closed session i'm now calling the regular meeting of the santa barbara unified district school board into order and now for information about interpretation for the meeting good evening we have spanish interpretation available we have the equipment here in the back and we also have interpretation over zoom muy buenas tardes tenemos interpretación al español disponible Tenemos el equipo aquí en la parte eh, trasera de la sala y también tenemos interpretación por medio de Zoom. We also have ASL interpretation. Thank you. Okay, um, and now Dr. Maldonado, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, good evening everyone. Please raise and face, face the flag. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, can you start with the superintendent report? Yes, please? thank you so much. And everyone that's in our audience, whether it's on Zoom or in person, will notice that we're all wearing pink today uh, to recognize Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I want to um, dedicate some of this to my own mother-in-law, Fuzi Tavakoli, who passed away from breast cancer, and my cousin Sandra, who passed away too soon from breast cancer as well. And we know that by wearing pink today, we are observing this uh, time for awareness, and it's important for people to know their risk, know how they can lower their risk for breast cancer, know their family history, know when to get a breast cancer screening, and know where to get a breast cancer screening. And we know that the CDC offers some free low cost screenings for women who qualify. Additionally, this uh, just yesterday, we have also Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, it is in May usually, but World Mental Health Day was celebrated on October 10th. Celebrated seems like an odd word to use. And according to World Health Organization, the objective is to raise awareness of mental health issues around the world and to mobilize efforts in support of mental health. As a district, we are proactively sharing materials with our students and staff to showcase resources, showcase resources that they have available to them if they are struggling or know someone who might be. I applaud student leaders that have made this a focal point in our district through their feedback and have provided personally to me as well as to our employees uh, their stories and, and advocacy so that we can continue to advocate for more resources at all levels, both in our school system, in our community, state, and uh, nationally. Yesterday was also um, Indigenous Peoples Day, and we want to honor the cultures and histories of the Native American people. This day is celebrated, uh, centered around reflecting on the tribal roots and tragic stories that hurt but strengthened their communities. With the Chumash deeply rooted in our community, we continue to be grateful to have access to their land, both while at school and at our homes. Our commitment will continue to be to honor the indigenous legacy in this community by looking at ways to celebrate the culture, learn on how we can better serve that community and find ways to infuse indigenous education into what we do. I had an opportunity last Thursday and I wanna thank Miss Emily Libera from Dos Pueblos. Her theater art students had an open mic event I was so moved. I was the only audience member along with the teacher. So it was almost like a private performance. And I was so moved and impressed with every single one of them. They got a chance to play music, um, do some poetry. And so we did talk about possibly uh, opening this up and it turns out that she sent me an invitation. So on November 10th and 11th at 7 p.m. and on November 12th at 2 or 7 p.m., they will be having an open mic event, and it's called The Plot Like Gravy Thickens. So I invite you to join students, and I can honestly say it is definitely worth uh, something that you should all spend time to go and do. 
I'd like to have you pull up our Heroes of the Heart nominees. We continue to get nominees, board members. Let me just pull up my own notes. So the first um, nominee is Susana Gutierrez Guerrero, nominated by Diana. She's the in the attendance office um, at Roosevelt Elementary. Uh, Diana said, I admire her dedication to service the families, always being kind and sweet. And I had a chance to be at Roosevelt myself the first week of school, and this is very indicative of Susana. Next, we have Luisa Figueroa from Monroe Elementary, nominated by Nagin, the office manager. She is always here early and leaves late. She cares for the students and staff. She's always willing to help with a big smile on her face. Lulu is our health assistant. Thank you, Lulu. Next, we have from Washington Elementary, Ms. Kay Cantu, uh, nominated by Ileana. And I think she's here in the audience. I don't know if you knew this. Uh, congratulations. And Ileana said, uh, es una excelente maestra, dedicación y pasión a sus estudiantes. Le encanta ayudarlos. Uh, si tienen alguna pregunta o si van bajo, los ayuda a ponerse al corriente. Es una y es una persona encantadora. She get that? We'll continue. Next, we have Ben Rudolph from Dos Pueblos High School, nominated by Shelley. Uh, he goes far beyond the call of duty and give, uh, gave her son options that have changed his whole outlook on his school experience and given our family peace of mind knowing our son has someone looking out for him that clearly cares. Mr. Rudolph rocks. Thank you, Mr. Ben Rudolph. Next, also in the audience, nominated by Alfa Ramirez, our very own Dr. Patricia Madrigal, nominated for her Dr. Madrigal is a true heroine because she puts forth 150% year round to provide several ongoing supports, including tutoring, mentoring, summer institutes, summer bridge for eighth graders, scholarships and parent engagement programs impacting several hundred students year round and truly deserves the honor as our peak madrina. Thank you, Dr. Madrigal. Next we have from San Marcos High School, Sarah Allers. She was nominated by Janie Thompson, and uh, she teaches students who are brand new to the country, often accommodating an overflow, and does so with compassion, creativity, and a can-do attitude. She truly represents the heart of San Marcos High School. And I have seen her in action, and this is exactly who she is. Next, we have Primrose Buenaluz from Santa Barbara High School, nominated by Melissa. Prim always goes above and beyond for her students in speech therapy. She works hard to make therapy applicable and fun for each student. Thank you, Prim. And last we have from our uh, district office nominated by Rachel, Kim Osburn, Osburn. Kim went above and beyond to help her family through a difficult time. She organized meetings according to what worked best for us. She checked in on my teen regularly. She coordinated an educational plan between di divorced parents fluently and peacefully. She spent many hours evaluating my teen, teen and ultimately she discovered the source of their challenges. Thank you to all the, those who have been nominated and for the, to the nominees for also displaying all the great um, values that we hold true in Santa Barbara Unified as we continue to be um, Hashtag we are unified. Um, that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And now we will go to board comments and correspondence. And I thought I would start off with some um, health facts about breast cancer. I used to work at you know the hospital at well Galita Valley and Cottage Hospital, and have worked with women who were being uh, tested and diagnosed. And I wanted to speak, you know, in memory of my Tia Angelica, um, my dad's favorite sister, and also my cousin Elvira, who was diagnosed when she first had her children. So the whole the lifetime of her children, she was quite ill with breast cancer. 
um, and in honor of two former co-workers that are being treated at this time. Um, also, one in eight women in the United States will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. In 2022, an estimated 287 1,500 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women in the U.S., and an estimated 2,710 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer in, in the U.S. Um, the importance of early detection and testing is, you know, cannot be um, emphasized enough, and certainly, you know, awareness. Um, with months like this and, um, you know, the the stigma sometimes in, I know for the Latino community of having, going and getting tested and finding out, you know, what you have so that you could start with treatment. Um, so thank you. I just wanted to um, to go ahead and state that. And um, Ms. Sims Moton, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. And yes, I'm so glad to be on this fierce women panel in terms of that, just the fierceness here, and just appreciate uh, being able here to also, in honor of my mother, who passed away from breast cancer at 55, no family history um, of that being in the family. And so that upped my, my schedule of having the breast exams, both self and actually with the doctor. Um, and it is a scary place, and sometimes it's culturally not to, to go, you're not, you don't have the support there, so it's really important that if you know someone, go with them, take their hand, hold their hand, how they're being a, a part of that, and as they, as they go through that, that's a really important piece about having someone there with you to go, and I know there's several support groups that are here locally and nationally where you might be able to go. And in addition to that, um, when my mother was diagnosed, it was also very important to talk about my brothers. Uh, since she was so close to her, it was, it was looking at me, so I got tested, didn't have that gene, um, but also that test in terms of men, because they tend to not think that it's, you know, it's talked more about women, but it does, as Ms. Amino just said, it does infect, uh, impact men as well, so it's important to make sure our men are going and getting their exams from the breast as well. Um, so I, I just um, just wanted to share that, and I just absolutely wear the power of this pink in my heart with my mom all the time, and she's always with me. So if you know me long enough, I'm probably sharing a story she said or something like that. Um, and then I, I just want to say that I had the opportunity to attend some back to school nights and the listening sessions, which continue to be very insightful for the action on the ground, um, and really taking an approach um, as a board member. What is the involvement as we're listening in terms, does this rise to a policy level and things that we need to do, we might need to advocate? Does it does it rise to uh, us advocating at the, the, the California State Board of Association? So what is a board, as we're listening to what things may be happening, some of it that we can take care of, some of it, you know, there's local things that we could do, maybe changing our policy, but really listening very quietly there. Um, I was at Goleta Valley Junior High uh, this morning and really appreciated the conversation there, very candid and transparent transparent um, conversation. Um, and then I think because there was a hero in the heart in that room, actually, there was a testimony of someone that, that was sharing that. So hopefully, they'll probably see them um, pretty soon. So just want to appreciate that. And then I also attended back to school nights at Adams as well as La Cuesta, which is great. You just continue to see that energy. Uh, at La Cuesta, we have some good food. So that always invites me. I'm ready to go. So uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so just appreciate all the work that everybody's doing and it's continued. Um, you know, we're being um, unified in the ways that we're doing it. Every effort, uh, as we say, centered around our student success and the environment that we're um, working in serving in, teaching and learning and how critical those pieces are. So um, thank you everyone that's here tonight and taking your time and, and coming to listen, be a part of our board. Ms. Caps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for your comments about breast cancer. I really appreciate what you shared. I wanted to, speaking of correspondence, um, just thank the community that reached out to us about Yom Kippur and having that be a um, holiday for staff and students and and uh, I was just very struck by the comments and how heartfelt this was so important to, to families and they reached out to us to one, um, one, one parent said, you know, finally, I got to share this holiest of days with my, my daughter and have the real contemplation that we needed as a family and it just really struck me. So thank you for reaching out. Um, and I'm glad that this is going to be a holiday next year. I understand uh, they put in their comments as well. So um, 
And then just a little PSA, uh, you, you should have your ballots if you register to vote. So I hope everybody please votes early because sometimes just it sits on the kitchen counter for a little too long and you miss that opportunity. So if you have it, put it in the uh, any of the ballot uh, drop boxes or your mailbox. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And those of you on Zoom, thank you as well. I've had the great uh, privilege of also participating in the listening tours at Dos Pueblos High School in San Marcos. And uh, of course, my favorite part is seeing the teachers there, seeing the staff and getting to know them and listening to their hopes, their aspirations and their suggestions. So thank you to all of those who attended. I also went to back to school night at McKinley School and um, I like to encourage cabinet members and my colleagues to visit McKinley more frequently. It's such a gem in our community. Uh, the staff hasn't had a permanent principal this year and their heart and soul is given to those students. The students want to learn. The staff is happy to be there. And I spoke to some of the teachers there. A lot of them are newer to McKinley, uh, all bilingual. And they said how much they appreciate having district staff there, having board members there, and how they look forward to that. So that was really heartwarming. So I hope that we can visit McKinley more, more frequently. So that was, that was really uplifting for me. In addition to that, of course, all the comments that were made about breast cancer, encouraging people to get checked. I know we're all busy, everybody's super busy, and the first thing to do is, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, but it might be a little late, so get checked. And thank you for being here. Ms. Foyt. Uh, thank you, President Munoz. Well, I too would like to draw re a recognition of my mother who battled with breast cancer. And I'm really delighted that we have pointed to this and uh, emphasized the importance of awareness and the importance of testing tonight. So thank you. Um, as is my job, I want to start with our email to the board report. And in the past two weeks, we received over 25 emails uh, to the board. Specific concerns were raised as follows. One, uh, we received six emails for smaller class sizes to continue, that they're making such a huge difference in our schools. Uh, one concern about the need for more special education para-educators. One concern about health education needing to be longer than just nine weeks, especially with the concerns about mental health. And 16 emails in gratitude, deep gratitude, for our observance of Yom Kippur. Uh, I, too, have been honored to continue to attend the school listening tours across the district in the last two weeks. I was part of the group that met with staff from San Marcos High School and Santa Barbara Community Academy. And I just want to publicly say thank you for the candor, for their suggestions, and for making us feel so welcome. I also noticed that in the past two weeks, 17 classified employees have been hired and five more substitutes have been hired. And uh, so just kudos to the HR department. I know they're working really, really hard to fill our vacancies. Um, I also just want to mention that I did attend the Santa Barbara High School all-class reunion on October 1st. It was really fun. There were dozens of classes represented from the years, all through the years. The program was really lovely. Um, activities and fun were fun. Uh, activities and food were fun and there were lots and lots of current students who also represented their clubs and their sports and the new bossy the cow was revealed so it was very exciting but as we celebrate so many things in the month of October I think it is important to remind everyone that today is International Day of the Girl it was originally sponsored by the United Nations. And as we all probably know, girls and women really had their rights affirmed back in 1979. But discrimination against girls and women continues to undermine their ability to thrive. Uh, you may know the history, but I'll just remind you that it was in 2011 that a collective of girls from across the globe got together and petitioned the United Nation to create 
the International Day of the Girl, focusing on girls' needs. And now, 10 years later, outcomes for girls are improving, but change is slow. It has been particularly slow and not equal for young women and girls who are indigenous, racialized, LGBTQ, living with a disability, or of low economic, socioeconomic uh, status. And we all know, even personally, that adolescent girl activists have led some of the most important movements of the last decade, fighting for their rights uh, to be safe from violence, for education, for climate justice, and their right to political representation. Just look to my right, Ms. Kavya. But we're still a long way from equality, so let's remember today, especially that girls are still fighting for their rights, and let's make sure they're not fighting alone. Thank you. Okay, um, Kavya, our star board member. Thank you all so much for your comments, and thank you, board member four. That was very sweet of you. Um, I have a few updates to give, but I'm also really excited because Today is our first student spotlight, so we'll be hearing from a student besides myself, and I'm really excited to jump into that in a second. So we had our first superintendent's advisory council meeting um, two weeks ago, and it was really successful. We were able to give some great feedback, and we had some of our cabinet members there to hear from our students, so that was awesome. And I'm looking forward to the next one, which will be next Wednesday. I also want to acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day, which occurred yesterday, and I urge our board to continue acknowledging the unceded land that we are occupying today and continue recognizing the history and legacy of Indigenous people in the United States as we continue to do decolonial work. I also want to acknowledge the personal input that I've received from students on having Yom Kippur off. It was a space for them to finally feel included, finally feel accepted and embraced for their religious practices. And it was, to many students, an opportunity for them to spend the day with family and with community, which is really um, what the festival and holiday is all about. So I commend the district on taking moves to make sure all religions and all cultural groups feel included and feel like their needs are accounted for as well. And without further ado, I just want to transition into our first student spotlight. So these series are just going to be highlighting some students who are doing important work in our district and also, you know, give them the opportunity to speak about issues that are, they are passionate about so the board can have an opportunity to hear from folks on what change needs to be made. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the one and only Dawson Kelly. Thank you, Kavya, for the introduction. Board, uh, Superintendent Maldonado, it's nice to see you all. Uh, it's really interesting to be on this side of all of you. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Dawson Kelly. I'm the former student board member and the current ASB president for San Marcos High School. Um, if I could get my slides up. OK, perfect. So I mean, no surprise to any of you, I'm talking about mental health. Um, pretty typical. This was something that I was passionate about since the beginning of my time on the board. And now that I've taken the time to reflect um, since being off the board, I have some slides for all of you to highlight the importance of mental health in our system, in our world, and in our overall community. So um, next slide, please. So just some statistics from uh, YouthWell that I found. Um, one in five youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 24. 50% of adults with a mental health illness experience symptoms by age 14, and 75% emerge by age 24. And as of 2019, Santa Barbara County is ranked 18th out of 58 counties in California for high suicide rates. And then um, just from a personal anecdote, I've noticed on a daily basis high levels of untreated anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and various other mental illnesses. Um, I would say probably every two days I have a serious conversation with a peer, friend, um, student in the hallways about mental health and how either their parents aren't understanding, their teachers aren't understanding, they feel alone, um, and they really are calling out for help. And I think this is something that needs to be addressed within our system for it to change long term. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have more stats. So this is from 
a survey conducted by Harris Poll, um, a post-COVID-19 survey, that said 81% of teens say mental health is a significant issue for young people in the United States. Um, seven in 10 teens have experienced mental health struggles. Um, and then as you can see, there's a large percentage of teens that have experienced uh, other disorders. 61% of teens said that COVID-19 pandemic has increased their feeling of loneliness. And 79% of teens wish there was an inclusive environment or space for people in school to talk about mental health. So I'm not alone in this. That is four in every five students that is needing the, that are needing this and wanting this. And we just through, went through a huge global pandemic and now we are spending on average eight hours a day immersed with technology and information and stimuli. And we are neurologically being affected like drugs, essentially. This is having an effect on our brain chemistry, how drugs would. So I think that you as people in power in our education system need to implement some sort of practices that can help us deal with these um, unprecedented times and the toll that it has taken on our mental health. I think it needs to be addressed. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, the importance of being proactive. Uh, a lot of time and money is spent addressing crisis, where if we were to prevent crisis in the first place, um, then our resources would be used more efficiently. This would be informing students on healthy technology habits, how to build healthy relationships, how to communicate, how to tell when a friend is struggling, how to describe your own emotions, ways to take a break, and self-care, just to name a few. Um, as you all know, education has a ripple effect on our community, and it would be the same with mental health education. If a few students are informed, and ideally if all students are informed, this will ripple out into our greater community as a whole. Um, we can look at, we can learn to see when our friends are struggling and then refer them to support. We can act as support groups within our own classrooms when we all have the education. When we create environments where people can actually talk about mental health in a safe way, then a lot of our problems can be solved with each other and in a community-based model. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I have some long-term and short-term um, goals or services that I would like in place. So long term, ideally, um, would be more mental health services on campus, um, like mental health spaces, more counselors, classroom environments that are designed for all types of learners, like students with ADD, OCD, um, setting up classrooms where it's um, more, where it's easier for them to learn. That could be like standing desks, different types of chairs, um, certain fidget toys, or other things that would allow them to work with their mental illness and mental struggles. And then, of course, consistent mental health educations in all of our schools. Um, I know there are many different models that I could get into later on if we would like to have those discussions um, that we could implement without taking a whole period, but could still be consistent throughout our schools. Um, and then in the short term, times for classrooms to talk about mental wellness and provide current resources in our communities. So this could be like to teachers giving them like five minutes um, a day, just a prompt or like a resource that they could push out to students or maybe put in their um, Canvas page, things along those lines. And then um, optional assemblies with speakers on wellness related topics. Maybe we could sponsor certain speakers or educators that could help facilitate this ripple effect and create an environment where mental health is being talked about at schools. And then gather ideas and data from students on how we are doing to address their mental health um, I think it's important to get consistent data and um, reflections from students on how, as a district, we are addressing their mental health needs. Um, so thank you all for listening to me today. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Kavya, for inviting me to be the first speaker. Sounds great. Dawson, I do have a, a question. First yes. of all, thank you for that wonderful presentation. It's just an extension of what you started here on the board. And as you know, I, I'm always talking about how important it is when you talked about prevention, how, the power in prevention, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how can the early um, care and communicate, you know, community help with starting that. I know and we have to address the immediate problem right here, but to, to reduce those longer outcomes, how do we work with that early care and uh, mental health for our youngest kids? I know we're, and maybe we can start to work with First Five as an association, like currently right now, there's a commercial, if you see it, it's First Five California. 
there is a I think there's a mother and father and the, the little boys in, in a little distress in, in terms of that but giving those tools um, ahead of time how to work with those so that it doesn't get lend itself to the men, to the to the crisis so how can we prevent that in those early years so I, I'd be interested in as you're gathering this data how early care can really play a huge part in that and so that you have tools from the early on to deal with this because life has those different things there are certain things that certainly rise up to that crisis level but can we even start as little as two and three years how yeah. do we help yeah. those tools that they can carry on to do that so yeah and I, I love that idea I think that would also reduce the stigma in the first place when it's consistently talked about since the there too before they can even remember for sometimes because a lot of stigma starts when we don't talk about things until they're 15 14 you know that age so yeah consistently and early on thank you for that Ms. Albers Dawson thank you thank you very much for all the information and you mentioned your interactions with other students and mm -hmm. some of the concerns that they express do in your personal experience have you found if students are aware of the services that are offered at the schools? Mm -hmm. uh, several schools have counselors, we have services, but I don't know if the students are aware that that is available to them. Yeah, I would say a vast majority are not, from my experience. Um, I think maybe students in ASB or that are more involved um, or that have been in crisis before are more familiar, but I would say the everyday student would not know um, and, and sometimes even their parents are like oh that's not good for you or like a lot of the problems that I've seen has also been parents not being educated um, and then saying that these resources aren't valid so it's another thing thank you so that's definitely an area for us to look into how we can better communicate what's mm -hmm. available thank you thank you uh, I certainly understand the need for mental health in the schools and areas that are um, on the campuses that don't have that stigma you know come in welcome you know mm -hmm. come in you can be here um, because of that you know um, perception like oh my god I, I need help but I don't want to be identified as as needing that so I certainly would be interested in anything that we can do as a district to make it more user-friendly for all ages um, because we know that our kids are undergoing stress and anxiety and such and and so yeah certainly excellent presentation Dawson. thank you thank you so much Dawson and I just want to emphasize that what he's saying is I feel like can't be like promoted enough because what saved me was education like learning that what I was feeling is not how I'm supposed to feel. Like I'm not supposed to feel so burnt out, so drained, so exhausted. I'm not supposed to like, you know, wake up every day dreading every single thing. I'm not supposed to hate myself 24 seven. And so learning that that's not the way I'm supposed to live in my classrooms is what saved me. And so I can't emphasize enough that we have to start young and we have to normalize conversations, but we can't normalize remaining in a state of like mental health disorder that should not be normal and that sh unfortunately I feel like is for a lot of high school students um, but kind of to what board member Caps was saying another huge way that we can make a difference is pre-registering to vote I know that's kind of a segue but um, it's huge that we get engaged as teens and it's huge that we make sure that we are electing people who will put our needs first and that we are, if we are eligible, voting in favor of what we want to see happen in our community. Um, but again, I want to thank Dawson so much for being vulnerable and speaking on an issue that I think we've all been working on, but you really you know, put it out there from the very beginning. So thank you so much for that. And um, I don't necessarily like using the analogy of like, oh, if you get a cut, you would go to the doctor because I think mental illness comes with a lot more stigma and a lot more like, I think um, disparity than we like to acknowledge but the way that we are taught to stay home if we feel sick or you know take care of ourselves if we feel like some kind of physical symptom going on a lot of times we're taught to push through the mental symptoms and sometimes that pushing through you know leads to a breaking point so I encourage everyone to keep you know addressing your own symptoms monitoring your 
physical and mental health every single day and making sure that you take adequate breaks and that you take adequate rest and time for yourself so you can, you know, be good to yourself because at the end of the day, that's what's most important. So thank you, Dawson. Okay, um, and I know Dr. Maldonado, um, you wanted to comment on something. Well, I want to thank Dawson also. I have to jump on the thank Dawson bandwagon. And as some of you know, I have a brother who did suffer from mental illness. Um, and I also want to say that Kavya taught me how to take a diet from my cell phone. So the future is in good hands when we have leaders like Kavya and Dawson. And, and thank you for that. We'll continue to work with you and explore other ways. And I know that um, Ms. Edison was there taking notes, I'm taking notes, because we know that's something that will be worked through with our student services team as well. I also failed to mention that last week, or since we last met, I should say, we had a, liter a Love of Literacy luncheon where we were able to help Santa Barbara Ed Foundation raise over $30,000. But I want to personally thank our very own Vice President, Ms. Sims Bone, who was the, the MC of the event. Um, <laughs> Because we also know that literacy matters for voting, for learning about mental health, for learning about all the things we just talked about today. So thank you, Ms. Simpson, for that event as well. Thanks. That's it for me. OK, uh, thank you. We will now go to public comments on non-agenda non items. We have two requests to speak. Uh, Madam President, Kay Cantu, followed by Ashley Cornelius. Hello. Okay. Good evening, school board members, Superintendent Maldonado, and district administrative staff. Every child, every chance, every day. That's our motto. It's what we live by. If we want to give every child a chance at learning, then we have to be able to hear them every day. This isn't happening in all classes, and I can tell you why. It's class size. The more students we have in our classrooms, the fewer chances we have to hear their voices every day. I'm here on behalf of the elementary school teachers who are trying to make a difference and pick up the pieces from remote learning. This is a time when we need to be giving every child every chance and every day. But the larger class sizes are making it difficult for us to meet the high social, social emotional needs of students coming out of the pandemic. We need fewer students in the classroom in order to deal with the very real trauma and learning loss. I would also like to put in a pitch for reconsidering the district's policy of averaging classes. By averaging fourth through sixth grade, we end up with huge swings of class sizes. I can't tell you how many times we've had 23 students in fourth grades, maybe 26 in the fifth grade, and 33 in sixth grade. I speak from personal experience of having many years of 33 students, while colleagues in fourth grade have 21 or 22. My students miss out on those one-on-one -on -one experiences because just not enough time in the day. I've spoken to fellow teachers and researched the optimal number of students to have per elementary class, and I've found that districts that have a cap of 20 to 1 in the K through 3 grades and 25 to 1 in the 4 through 6 grades fare better in test scores, student engagement, and teacher satisfaction. By the way, please do not exclude the gate classes from this cap. Very often, they have the highest class sizes on campus. If the district cap ends up being 1 to 25, then it has to be applied to the gate classes too. So how can we do this? Well, we can do this by looking for some space and hiring more teachers. So let's be creative. Seconds. Be creative with the space. We know that we have schools with declining enrollment. There are many options that to do. Let's spend the money where it needs to be spent on more people that can help and hear the children every day, every chance. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cornelius. Hi, 
All right, thank you board members and Dr. Maldonado for taking the time to listen to our concerns. My name is Ashley Cornelius. I've been teaching in the district for 17 years and um, I'm at Santa Barbara High right now. Um, I want to take the time to emphasize the importance of maintaining small class sizes from the high school teacher um, pers and perspective. Um, I know that while the budget is being worked on, it might be tempting um, when you see how much money it will cost to maintain our low class sizes to be like, what's a couple more students? What's another three students in every class? It feels like a very small number um, compared to the vast amount of money it will cost um, to keep our class sizes low. Um, but those few students make a huge difference in how much time it takes to grade and spend time with them in class. Um, and so as a science teacher, I want to provide you with a concrete example with some numbers. Um, I currently have up to 90 students a day. And when I'm grading an assessment that I want to read in depth and provide feedback for my students, it's going to take me at least three minutes for every student. So that's going to take me three of my planning periods um, throughout the week to be able to get through that and to provide some good, solid feedback for them. Um, even adding nine students to my day um, brings that up to another 30 minutes every week that I would be spending on grading those assessments and giving them feedback. Um, that extra 30 minutes um, means that I have to make increasingly difficult decisions. Should I grade those assessments or should I email the counselor of the student who is out in my hallway crying? Do I um, call the parents of students who have a B so that they can get good feedback and know how they can get to an A? Or do I call home to the parents of students who have a D plus to help them be able to get to a C? Um, should I try to improve my lesson that I'm going to give the next day? Um, or should I make sure that I give feedback to the students in a timely manner so that they can actually make improvements and, and know what their grade is? Um, so while adding three more students to each class seems like a small number, especially when we're comparing it to the big cost that it takes, um, that really adds a really significant um, decisions and moments that are affecting all of my students. 30 seconds. Grading assessments is just an example of something that's non-negotiable. I have to do that as my job. Um, but that naturally, so that naturally pushes in to all the extra things I want to do. Um, I want to be writing letters of recommendations for my students. I want to help them one-on-one -on -one during my planning period. Um, I'd like to email the teams of teachers if a student is struggling. Um, that's where all my extra minutes go right now. Um, and in order to make the experience of all of my students Time. better. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. You could submit that if you have some additional writing so we can read it all. So, okay. All right. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay. Um, we will go to the acceptance of donations. Um, board members, do I have a motion? Yes. Uh, I move to approve with gratitude the donations. And I second with gratitude. Okay. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, uh, passes unanimously. Now we will go to the consent agenda uh, to approve the items that are considered routine and are not likely to require any discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that the board approves all the consent agenda items. The board has also had the opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. Are there any public comments on these items? No? Okay. Uh, seeing none, um, board members or Dr. Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information or, or such? Ms. Alvarez? I have a comment on number nine, um, the contract with Earl Warren. It's great. I'm glad we're doing it. There was interest during the listening tours they were asking about when this was going to happen. So it'd be great for us to start communicating this to the high schools. They were specifically asking about when the showcase would take place. I'm looking to uh, Dr. Sheffield. I believe we have sent out the communication through our leadership memo to all leaders uh, for November 9th. So yes, that was taken care of. Oh, great, and thank we, you. We'll put it on the board. Um, calendar as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? There we go. So we are planning on doing a presentation for the next board meeting on the showcase. Information has been sent out with, to the staff, and we are working with the school sites and putting together an amazing presentation for all of you to view. So we want it to be amazing, so we'll be doing it on the 25th. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, board members, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, um, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, uh, consent agenda passes unanimously. Now we'll move to the action agenda. Number one, the approval of two new job classifications. Short stop. He must have been a short stop. Good evening, Board President Munoz, board members. I'm going to go ahead and um, dominate the action agenda tonight. Thank you very much. Um, this uh, first item is the approval of the two job classifications um, that I listed for you. There it's a clinical social worker one and a clinical social worker two. If uh, Just to remind you, I, I think it's been a while since I've brought in a new job description to you, but just to remind you of the process is um, each of these new positions and new job descriptions are negotiated with um, CSEA. Once we go through that process and we get a tentative agreement on what the salary range will be, the different job, essential job functions, et cetera, qualifications and requirements, um, then we bring that forward to the board for approval. So a lot of work has been done on these two job descriptions already. Um, this is... Um, Two, two really key points here. One of the um, positions will be um, actually placed at San Marcos High School, and that position will take the place of the extra hours that we have currently with FSA serving in that function at San Marcos High School. And then the other position is going to, one of the key features of the other position is going to allow us to do the supervision of um, of our, the clinical supervision of current employees and and previously we were um, contracting that out to someone else and I also have as backup here tonight um, Kenya Edison who um, can share any details if the board has any other specific questions regarding programming of these two positions so with that I'll turn it over to the board for any questions you might have Ms. Ford? Uh, thanks. Just to clarify, how many people are we talking about hiring? Two? Two. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez? And uh, you mentioned one of these FTEs will be placed at San Marcos. Is that a full-time position? Yes. Do you know if that's eight hours? Yes. It's eight hours. And I noticed the funding says SR2. Uh, when, remember when the SRO decision was made? It was specifically said that it was going to be a social worker was going to be assigned to San Marcos and that was going to be part of the general fund. So is this the same thing or is this different? I can confirm that this is a clinical social worker that will be placed at San Marcos High School in response to that. Funding source, I'm going to have to ask um, that. I'm not sure if anyone else has an answer to that around whether it's going to transition over to the general fund or not. I, I'm. I'm assuming it that to. When it has that to. <laughs> I just I want to make sure that it's part of our budget every year. I know we're using ESSER now, and I want to make sure it continues. Okay. Just to be clear, can we we, we can use ESSER, and when it yeah. runs out, it's going to general. Fund. That's that's okay. what that's. Yeah. Thank you. We just wanted to be strategic with our funding with the ESSER two, and then it definitely will be transferring yeah. to general. And I fund. totally appreciate that. I just want to make sure that it's a permanent job and that it continues for the San Marcos High School. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, can I just jump in? I will say that we will be probably bringing this back, um, this position, as we continue to also negotiate the community resource deputy, which we've been asked to negotiate for San Marcos. So at some point, we'll coordinate all of that. I just want to make sure that we didn't take it fully away and that we will be still bringing that back. But we are. This is our between um, reimagining safety solution. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 
I just had a question on just connecting uh, these positions or anything that we're talking about mental health to our MTSS. Where, how, how are we connecting that so that every time we're doing things, it's adding on, it's expanding and, and addressing the issue, if you could address that. So as we build internal systems to serve our students' needs, so this would be an addition, the supervision piece would be an addition to our, our current um, crisis care workers because they also need direct supervision, but it also um, allows for us to systematize across our whole district our, our mental health responses by having someone with this level of, of, of um, credential. Okay, so as I'm learning and in, in from your presentation, in, in, in the MTSS system, we have tier one, two, and three. So how do, so bringing on that help expands the help being in tier one as opposed to tier two and three, is that So a, it actually does all three tiers okay. because we have the content expertise to build capacity across tier one, which is all kids getting what they need, when they need, from, um, from whom they need it. But our tier three is our intensive supports. That's where our crisis care folks come in at. Right now we have two of those folks across the district and then we partner with our community-based organizations, FSA and Calm, to meet some of those needs. But they also refer to our internal folks. And so we need to really build capacity within our system at all tiers. Although, as you know, as I said, our focus is tier one for sure this year. Yeah. Okay. And then just one more, just a clarification, and just tying the data, you know, that Dawson um, presented today. How does that tier three, that's an intensive, is there a link to that data that they were saying the level of crisis that our students in correlate to what's you know the level of students or the data in the tier three is there a correlation there or? so there is definitely a correlation okay. but remember one of our high leverage practices of mtss is using data to guide decisions so okay. being really intentional about the data we collect um, really differentiating between mental health crisis and social emotional dysregulation yes. and making sure all of the folks in our system can do the same and we're not using crisis over generalizing behaviors yes. or under underestimating what the needs of students and so we, we met with youth well today and partnering with us on our mtss and being a part of our district leadership team and extended that offer so that we have the content experts in the room as well to connect community resources i really appreciate that because i've just been having you know conversations in the community about overgeneralizing crisis, right, and how do, how do we do that, but not to minimize what's going on. So I really appreciate that's the approach that's taking, and also being in the community in, in several places to be able to, to share what we're doing through our MTSS yeah. to, to address these issues. We're hoping that the road is, it might be short and narrow anyway to that two and three. We really want to be able to catch early in, in that sense. So, so thank you for that. So I think it has been like crisis, overgeneralized, in, in a way that we, we may be missing things because we think everything is a crisis. We're not having really developing or using those tools that help us, you know, get there before it's a crisis. So. Yeah, and also want to highlight that that practice of MTSS that we identify ways for all staff to support wellness for students. Yeah. And so although it may not rise to a level of a clinical support, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that we have safe spaces everywhere? And folks understand that when we say building relationships for students, there's some deliverables for us as adults. Mm -hmm. And so calibrating that in tier one is how we minimize the impact on tier two and three and we've had conversations with calm and FSA as well we meet every month to uh, to hear their experiences from the ground so mm -hmm. that we now know we do need to calibrate on what we call a crisis yeah. and what and the difference between mental health and social and emotional dysregulation yeah I, I, I really appreciate that it tells me because I was struggling with like not everything's a crisis but I didn't want to to minimize that or to mm -hmm. to dismiss that but there is that that difference and how do we then start to lay those things but it also helps in terms of the mental health, early mental health um, things Absolutely. that we're addressing as well. And is, is youth well a part of the behavior wellness department? Is They're that a, separate, but they, they do have a community collaborative that okay. also includes Be Well. Okay, yes. perfect. All right, well, thank you. Ms. Kapps? Yeah, thank you. Just to build on what uh, Mr. Kelly just said about students not necessarily knowing that these services are there, and I, I recognize this, is, this probably is a site um, plan of how to get the word out like that there's a social worker and this is what he or she does and here's the picture and I don't you know I mean it like I, I'm just, it sounds like you have a some really motivated students that might help that principal get the word out but I just uh, you know we heard the other a uh, couple meetings ago from Dr. Vecchio that there's so many you know there's all these psychologists there's mental health counselors like we've done so much I feel like from this perspective but if it's not being felt by the students mm -hmm then that's the disconnect that I just would encourage Mr. Kelly's very, you know, thoughtful presentation and his observation backed up by Kavya that, uh, you know, that can be conveyed and I'm sure it will be just to be as creative as possible to 
get the word out. Like mm -hmm. feeling, I, again, I'm not going to wordsmith it, but if, you know, describe what a, a typical, um, if a student's feeling a certain way or having a certain problem, why should they go, should they go see this social worker? What are they there for? What are their skills? What are their, what are they there to offer? You know, and really make it very real for students. It's a great opportunity to highlight and to calibrate. One of the things that we are doing is making a team approach to student wellness. So it isn't just the social worker. It's also bringing in right. our family engagement liaisons. It's also all of our front office staff. Yeah. And so that's a great opportunity for the campaign of knowledge for, for our students. So we'll be very intentional in that, as well as bringing in our parent component, which is right. part of our MTSS, is how do we engage with our community, which is our families and our community partners with a strategic plan that's attached to who's better off because of the work and so really monitoring progress monitoring that data so that was right on time what Dawson presented great thank you okay Kavya um on that note of like access I just wanted to know at San Marcos there are like flyers and posters up around campus and on Dos Pueblos's website on their like counseling page they do have like a wellness section um but the issue is there is there are so many barriers that you have to go through to like I can't just get up in class and be like I'm having an anxiety attack I need to go usually like at first you have to talk to the teacher so you have to have the comfortable relationship with the teacher to approach them and say hey I'm feeling really anxious right now and then you have to you know undergo like okay well can you like stay in the corner of the classroom because we have a lot of like work to do today and then you have to like explain no I really need to go and then after that they'll say do you need to go to your counselor do you need to go to the psychologist do you need to just like go home like they'll ask you where you need to go and then you have to make that decision for yourself and then after you go there usually in the hallways you're stopped and then you're asked why are you not in class and you have to explain I'm having like mental health symptoms right now I need to go and then after that they'll usually say okay well can you try to like sit in the hallway and calm down so you can go back to class because they want to keep you in your like instructional minutes and then it's a process to get from hey like I'm stressed out I need to leave I need to take a break to actually being able to do that so I think part of it is also maybe equipping teachers or just school like campus staff and faculty in general with like if a student approaches you and says that they're experiencing some kind of mental health symptoms always believe, always support, don't, you know, create these barriers of like, let me ask you 15 questions and try to do the, you know, mental health questionnaire in this moment. And then also in terms of like the resources that we do have, I know what's available because I'm part of ASB. I've been involved in student leadership and I've also been involved in understanding what resources are available for students. Dawson knows, but like he said, for a lot of students, they don't read those posters. A lot of students like those public students, Issa was telling me, they don't really go on the school website. Um, they don't, you know, sometimes the school psychologist's office is like kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like you don't really know where it is. It's not really publicized. It's kind of just like in a corner. So I think part of it is equipping teachers, fac like faculty and staff to, you know, like recognize when a student's having mental health symptoms and allowing them to do what they need to do, whether that be go to the psychologist, whether that be just sit outside and take a breath of fresh air. Um, but then also part of it is making it really clear, like putting it in the morning announcements, putting it, you know, all over campus, like here it is, kind of creating a physical reminder of the office and space that's there for them. But then also having these um, employees out in like the halls if they can with the kids, just making their presence known on campus instead of them sitting in the office all day. So they're a recognized face on campus. We feel comfortable with them. We have that relationship. And then when I feel like, hey, I think I need something, I can go to their office and check in with them. So th that, I just wanted to include that student perspective that there are a lot of barriers and it's not as simple as saying I need to get help, I need to leave. Um, and, and I'm saying that as someone who's very privileged with very caring and compassionate teachers who will allow me to take that break. But even then, I have so many people to answer to and I have so many questions to answer to. So just thinking about that. Ms. Ford? Uh, thank you for the presentation and really thank you for these two positions. Um, just to piggyback on things that my fellow board members have said, this is really important at San Marcos and I, I can only underscore that at the, uh, at the listening tour I was struck uh, so deeply by the caring concern that staff members had to, for the need for a social worker. And so I'm hoping not only that we will pass this action item, but that uh, word will get out to the San Marcos staff as soon as possible. Ms. Elvers? 
Dr. Becchio or in, or Ms. Edison with the assumption that if this passes tonight, what is the timeline in hiring somebody? Have we advertised yet or are you waiting for this to be approved, I imagine? Um, no, the, we're, we will post um, once pending approval tonight. And um, that just depends on, it really depends on the candidates, how many candidates we get, if we get qualified candidates, once we get them, um, are they working at another job and how much time do they have to give? So it's really hard to pinpoint down how long that'll take. Um, ASAP. Pardon me? <laughs> but ASAP. But ASAP, ASAP would probably be a month. In the meantime, are we not using FSA anymore for this services? Oh, we absolutely are. The need is great. And so mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a place for everyone to serve students. And so, again, I remind you all, students with us are 180 days, and they're with Community 365. So we still need to partner to ensure kids are served. And so this is not replacing our FSA supports. This is an addition to. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, board members, do I have a motion? I move that we. Pa oh, did I? Be here? <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, uh, you can take it. No, I move okay. that we approve the two job descriptions as presented. Second. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay. Passes unanimously. Excellent. Okay. Um, now we will go to the approval of the contract with Maxim Healthcare. Thank you very much. And I do want to mention at the, at the outset that this actual item has been a collaboration between Ms. Edison in Student Services Department, myself um, in HR, and then John Shetler. Um, both are available tonight. John Shetler and I will be presenting this item to you. Um, I, want, I want to um, start by giving you an HR perspective on this. Um, I gave you some information in last week I also gave you some information in this board item on the description. What I noticed actually is that the, the factors were not completely listed in the description. So when it pasted in there, I don't think it had room in the platform to put it all in there. So I wanted to just paint an HR picture of the circumstances that we're under, which I would call them, I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and the people sitting in HR that have been in HR a long time have not really ever seen anything like this as well. I would call it um, in this space of paraeducator a dire circumstance at this point. And so hence why we, the, the three of us and others have been working um, on what kind of solutions can we come up with. Um, we hear it all over the schools with parents, with teachers, paraeducators, um, that uh, we really need to do something to fill these spaces. So. Let me just really quickly um, summarize the factors that that we're up against and why we're seeing this dire circumstance. Um, we have vacancies in our teaching, particularly our special ed teaching positions, and that's just not ours, but in, in all school districts, that's a trend. What we see happening is some paraeducators moving into those teaching positions. Um, and we're able to do that through some, some ed code stuff and they don't have to be fully credentialed. Um, we as an organization, and again, many other organizations in the state, all across the state, have added um, general education paraeducator positions and bilingual paraeducator positions. So that increase in those same level positions compete with our, para, our special ed para positions. We've also... Um, you know, it's, it's great that we received s such large amounts of money during COVID to help us through that process, but what that also did was um, it created, um, it created an, a situation where all districts were receiving that money, and so all districts were opening positions. Um, and so that was a phenomenon we saw that, that we really battled against in HR because if it was just our district getting funding and we were opening positions, no problem. Uh, that's a good problem to have. This one was money was everywhere and positions were everywhere. And so that, that um, was challenging. Our commuting employees, what we saw quite frequently was them taking positions in their community because there were now community positions. Um, school districts everywhere were opening positions, needing employees, and so 
uh, that was advantageous to them because they obviously save time and money from not having to commute. Um, the labor market has been extremely in an extremely short supply, as you've probably heard throughout our community and the nation. Um, and then um, the great resignation you've heard about, and we definitely have seen more resignations than we've we've ever seen. I wanted to bring those factors to the forefront because they didn't, number one, make it in the description. But number two, it I just don't think it's enough to say that, um, oh, well, there's a great recession or, hey, it's challenging right now. There's not a lot of candidates. These are some factors that are that, that make those two statements real and, and what's really um, happening out there in the in the um, job market. So with that, I'm going to also ask John Shetler. He um, just has a, a couple items to share about the special ed perspective. Then we'll get into our, um, our ask of the board. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Becchio. I want to add that from a special education perspective, we have seen an increase in the demand for paraeducator positions in our schools since the pandemic hit. Uh, we've added about 40 positions since pre-COVID, and mainly those are coming from IEP teams supporting students' behavioral needs. Um, so we've heard in lots of different ways how kids have been impacted, um, but this is another one. And so compounded with the hiring um, landscape that Dr. Becchio referred to, it's just really a tough space for us, and I don't think there's one silver bullet solution to resolve it. So I think we need to look at multiple um, ways to fill these positions. I would point out that uh, Maxim would not be our only agency that we're partnering with. We have two current contracts with Star of California and with California Psych Care. Uh, they are also providing folks to fill paraeducator positions in special ed. Um, there are some key differences with our contract with California Psych Care, Star of California, and this potential one with Maxim. Those other agencies are providing behavior aids who already are working in many cases in homes with families and have training and background in special education and working with kids with disabilities. Maxim is doing a lot of the same recruitment that we are doing to grab people who um, have an interest in getting into special education classrooms, many for the first time. And so um, it is a different sort of um, profile of, of employee that we're recruiting through Maxim. But Maxim also has given us a way to bring those folks into our organization long term. So our contract with them has language that allows us to hire those folks on um, with no fee attached to that once they've worked for us a certain number of hours. For most paraeducators, that's about three-fourths of a school year. If they've worked um, under Maxim's contract for that amount of time, we buy them out at no cost if we want to hire them directly. So we're building our internal capacity by doing that. Um, the third thing that I would add is we put a not to exceed amount for $500,000 on this item, which is mainly offset by the classified salaries that we're not able to use when we can't fill positions. But that also is reflective of 15 individuals that Maxim um, can deploy into our schools right away. Um, and that if we are able to get more folks through Maxim, we can come back at a future time and request additional funds um, to increase that contract. So that could happen. Um, I would remind the board that we've worked with them before, and in 2019, we had 47 paraeducators through Maxim in our district. Uh, many of those folks are still working with us today as district employees. So um, I, I just want to point out it's not a, an either or when it comes to other agencies um, or in recruiting folks directly to hire. I think we need to have multiple approaches. And with that, Dr. Becchio and I welcome any questions from the board. Okay, um, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you both for the great explanation. Thank you for the board backup. That's really helpful. Also, during the listening tours, this also came up as a concern from our classified staff and our teaching staff, with, which really highlights their care and their interest in student well-being. They were so concerned about providing the services to students. So I thank you for looking at different ways uh, to fill this need being that it's so difficult to hire a permanent staff at the moment. So thank you. Okay, Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you. Uh, I too just want to share my gratitude because of the need being so great and um, your creative, thoughtful problem solving on this need has means a lot to me. I'm really appreciative of building internal capacity. That was an issue that we had uh, in the past, and it seems like that's been addressed with Maxim and between uh, 
and the district so wonderful. Uh, I love the idea that we are addressing the immediate need tonight, but we could be addressing a future need and more help from Maxim in the future. And also, I'm not sure if either of you mentioned it, but I do think it's very important that you are making the recommendation that the HR specialist sit with special ed and actually just focus 100% on this need. I think that's a key and it's really important, so thanks. Um, board members, do I have a motion? <laughs> I move that we approve the contract to provide paraprofessional support as presented. Thank you. And seconded. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Passes Thank unanimously. You and we will go to the re discussion agenda. Uh, report on the sale of the bonds by business services. I know. $53 million. Of $53 million. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Apologies. Go ahead. Okay, good. Good evening, board members and Dr. Maldonado. Tonight, I come with a joyful presentation regarding the bond sales. I invited our wonderful financial advisor from KNN, um, Daniel Arruda, to be here and answer any questions that we might have or you might have, especially the technical questions. I leave those to her. We had been preparing for this moment since July, um, at which time we have been talking about selling the last little bit, little $53 million bit of the bond sales for Measure I and Measure J, both of them. And finally, on September 28th, our bonds went to market. We were warned that it might be a tough time to sell the markets are very volatile, volatile right now because the Fed recently raised the interest rates to help combat inflation and that it could be a nail-biting experience. But what an exciting day it was. Next slide, please. So, wow, did we have strong investor love. In two hours, all of the bonds were sold for both Measure I and Measure J. We needed to sell $53 million worth of bonds, no small number, but in the end, we sold $307 million worth of bonds. That's an oversell of 5.8 times in the aggregate. And because of this significant investor demand, our overall pricing was improved. The actual cost of issuing the bonds or what they say the aggregate true interest cost was only 3.99%. Our credit rating by Moody's, the AA1, contributed to the great sale during tumultuous market conditions. Next slide, please. So our Moody's rating um, is AA1, and one of the things, well, a couple of the reasons that we were given such a great credit rating was one was the fact that we are a community funded district. Number two was that our healthy financial position due to prudent fiscal management, due to great leadership, and due to our high reserves. And then the final one was the fact that our community provides a very strong tax base. We live in a great place surrounded by great people. Next slide, please. So on the day of the sale, I got to tell you that this was an amazing moment, so much fun. This is the graph that shows how the day went, well, two hours, how quickly this happened. So the top part of the slide is the part that's in blue. That's our measure I bonds when we needed to sell 35 million. And you can kind of see just barely that little yellow line across the bottom of those, those bond sales. And all the blue that's above it was all the oversell. 
So especially right there in the middle, the 10-year maturity, um, we ended up selling that one uh, where's it, 15.7 times over what we needed to sell. And then, so then down in the bottom, the green section, that's the Measure J bonds, and they also all oversold. And it was fun to watch that in my office. <laughs> I brought in people from the district, from HR, from purchasing, from facilities, from everywhere. Come watch this, because this is us watching our community show us how much they care. This is how much our investors love Santa Barbara Unified. And it was really, really a great thing to watch, to witness. Next slide, please. So this is kind of the way it, it works out now. So the um, tax rate for Measure I is now estimated to be $10.83 per 100,000 of assessed property value. What does all that mean? It means that property owners will see an addition on their annual property tax bill to pay back these bonds. An example is if a property is assessed at a million dollars, the total added to the bill will be $108.30 for the year. So that's kind of how every property owner will see different values depending on how much their assessed property value is. Okay, next slide please. So for Measure J, um, the, it's, it's a similar kind of ideal, so it's $12.06 as an estimate per 100000 So again, if you had a uh, million dollars for your assessed value on your property, you'll see an additional $120.60 for the year. So that's it, but thank you, and I really enjoyed being able to give you this happy news, and I look forward to completing all the amazing projects that we're going to be able to do now that we have these bond funds and um, to really make our uh, school sites better places. Anybody have any, if you have any questions, and also Danielle is here to help us if you do. Okay. I just, just for the public might think, because the, the, the happiness and joy that we're showing the overselling, did that mean we got more than the 53 million we were looking for, or just what does it? Just to be clear, because that yes. might be an expectation. Yes. Yeah, so what that means is we got our 53 million that we were asking for, but because there's so much more, it actually brings the cost of that we have to pay in um, just the cost of actually doing the bond um, down yeah. reduces those. Thank you. Kim, I might just jump in here for just a moment, uh, just to put some real numbers behind it. Um, when we first began the process before um, investors were able to actually place their orders, we were looking at a true interest cost or TIC of four basis points higher than what was actually finalized. So because of that strong investor demand, we were able to work with the underwriter to lower the overall uh, interest rates and yields, which resulted in a lower cost of funds to the district. So a tremendous job by the district in keeping its uh, AA1 rating and wonderful job by uh, district staff. They were stellar in that rating meeting and I think were a huge contributing factor to uh, the confirmation of the district's rate. I'm sorry, uh, district's credit. Um, credit rating. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Danielle. <laughs> okay, Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you. Yes, congratulations to your team. Nice job. <laughs> Very proud. Uh, to confirm, just what, what I think I saw on the two tables is that this is a one-time raise, and then for how many years it stays the same rate? Um, right. So how many years is that, Danielle? Let's see. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, what we depicted on those various graphs is uh, the debt service. So the final maturity of both uh, Series C bonds for both measures is only 19 years. So final maturity will be in 2041, uh, at which point we have a level tax rate of about $10.83 for Measure I, and then um, pretty much a level tax rate of $12.06 for Measure J. Uh, 
There is some additional debt service related to prior bonds, uh, the Series B bonds that were issued. So overall, both measures will um, come to maturity in August of 2044. Uh, the one huge point here, though, is those yellow lines for each of the uh, bar graphs signify the estimated highest tax rate that was going to be needed to levy for the debt service for these bonds. As you can see in both instances, because of the district's strong investor uh, demand, as well as assessed valuation growth, the district is much lower than those estimates that were uh, provided to the district's constituents back in 2016. So kudos to the district uh, for both the tremendous bond sale as well as uh, the growth in your overall strong tax base. Ms. Alvarez. Thank you, Ms. Stellar, uh, <laughs> Kim Hernandez, <laughs> and your team. We really appreciate it. And it really shows our, our community, the excess value, what the strong property tax, the strong base that we have, and the importance of working with a community. And thank you to taxpayers out there for <laughs> paying that bill because that helps our facilities and it fails, of course improves our education system. So thank you very much for your work and thank you KNN for your partnership also. Okay, um, thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and, and take a 10 minute break at this time and we'll, we'll be right back. Okay, um, welcome back. We're going to go into uh, the discussion agenda number two, discussion of racial incidents. So as the board has requested, um, we are bringing forth a re uh, the summary of the reports that have come in on the racial incidents tracker. Um, next slide. And these incidents were tracked between September 23rd through October 6th, which is when this report came through. Um, there were seven racial incidents. Um, of those seven, three were negative targeting um, other students based on race. Four of them was inappropriate casual use of the N-word um, indirectly. And so uh, we had that represented. We had two at elementary school, four at junior high school, and one at the high school level. That is the end of my report. Are there any questions? What are we doing? In terms of these reports here, I mean, it's a report that tells us this, but what are we doing? So we're working on district a district wide response for uh, school wide lessons on social awareness, which is, as you know, a core competency of the social emotional learning, which is self awareness, self management. Social awareness is where this empathy and where the competencies that lack that that we're lacking, our students are lacking. Um, that's triggering these behaviors. And so we have, as you know, we have a teacher on special assignment whose sole work is student engagement. And we're meeting with counselors as well to talk about how do we push into every classroom and have classroom lessons across the district at all grade levels, really focusing on social awareness uh, throughout the, the next couple of months. So, so that's our first tier. So are we sharing with our students, sharing back this data with our students and how important they are to reducing these incidents, how critical they are to this piece? That is a very, that's a good question. And I don't believe we are sharing it in conversation with students. Um, that would be a great strategy to talk age appropriately with students on what these are. So we have not, we have not planned that far ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly one, one voice here, but I think that's an important piece to, to know they understand how critical they are to changing the environment. And if you're looking at these numbers and, and you know, not calling anyone out, but we as a district, we had seven racial incidents across four schools. How do we hope to learn from this and reduce that to coming to zero? Absolutely. You know, something to look, to look forward to as opposed to here's what's happening in, in terms of just reporting, just doing a little bit more, it, getting the students more involved in the reporting of the numbers. So we're, you, we will use this data to guide decisions, and we mm -hmm. would definitely add that as a, a step in the process, the, how do we communicate this back to students? Because I would, I would say that I, I would, we would treat this as a crisis as well. So I, I think to, to raising it to that level of, you know, again, as we're talking to students about crisis, what, you know, elevates to a crisis or whatever, I think this is a crisis here. And I think the fact that we still report them, 
that's we're in a crisis mode of that how we handle it and i don't want to overuse the word crisis but i think this is a relevant for this moment but then how do we use this moment through our mts through all those systems that we're creating how do we start to address this as well yeah, so for sure thank you and our other practice is making sure that the adults feel comfortable addressing it right that we don't fall on deaf ears but everyone has the skill set to address it in the moment yeah i appreciate that thank you uh Kavya? I just had a quick question, so, or I guess two. Um, how are these being reported? Mm -hmm. And then what are we classifying as racial incidents? Um, like, is there a specific criteria or is it like up to the individual? So they're being report reported by admin and the definition was calibrated across all school sites and principals. Um, and we're not just going by uh, intent, but impact. So it had a negative impact on another student and the content of it was racially motivated. And so that's how they're being tracked and that's where, the, where they're being identified at, using that shared understanding of the definition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ford? Thanks. Uh, I too know I'm only one voice, but I, I would really um, love to know the data in terms of uh, how it relates to all the data and so to see the trends and to see um, where the impact really is. I'm wondering if there's a possibility to create some sort of a table that would um, keep track of it from board meeting to board meeting and also keep track of it at least by grade level. Maybe we're seeing it at more grade, specific grade levels uh, and also the types of incidents. I'd like to see if there's a trend there. The only worth this has for me, of course, is to figure out how to get rid of it as soon as possible and that would be to understand the trends. Thanks. Yes, I can bring that back. And can I just add, add on, oh, so, oh, so go ahead, Ms. Alvarez, go ahead. Please. Thank you. I'm also interested in, there's seven in, in, incidents. Mm -hmm. Are there by seven different students? Do we have repeat students that, so the reports that you bring to us at every board meeting, are we seeing a trend that is this, the same students or this different students that are might be uh, using the inappropriate language? And you, you talk about intent and impact, which is great. Also, I'm interested in, in finding out what are we doing as far as the intent? Uh, how are we helping the students who are, who are doing what they're not supposed to be doing? So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm interested in that as well. So, would you, so what I can do is add in that um, data as a graph what the responses are. Because responses mm -hmm. are happening to these. You guys are getting raw numbers. Yes. These are seven individual cases. These are not repeat students. These are students individually each time. And so the sites are responding age appropriately, whether that's teaching what the expectation is, knowing what the harm is in the words, referring to counselors, refer, having parent conferences, helping students to understand why the not. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is a system mm -hmm. issue, so we need a system response. And so we're working on that system response with school-wide lessons so that we can get in front of and teach and have students help each other instead of adults having to manage all behaviors. Because that is a core competency. We want kids to be able to manage themselves and know what's appropriate and make responsible decisions, which are SEL competencies. Thank you. Yes, that would be great mm -hmm. if you can include Absolutely. that in your data, the response, and also, you know, are we teaching kindness mm -hmm. school-wide, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to add, will this data be part of the climate survey? Are we getting that, be a part of that time survey that we would be sharing with them? We absolutely can share this data with them. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you. If there are no more questions, thank you so much, Ms. Edison. Okay, we will go to item number three, um, filling the board seat vacancy. The process about that. Actually, Steve and I didn't decide which one of us is going to do this part. Um, but as you can see that, uh, and we discussed at the last meeting, that we were going to bring you the process items for this uh, filling the seat the vacated, the upcoming vacated seat. So we have the candidate application form. Sorry, the screen on my side is turned off.
So board members, we, we hope you had a chance to re review it, but the, are there any questions on the candidate application form? Are you good with the questions that we presented? This is an interactive presentation. Ms. Uh, Ms. Alvarez? Yes, on, uh, oh no, it's up now, I guess. No? No, no, no that's not that's the one. That's the JD. <laughs> what is that? Okay, anyways. Yeah. So on the candidate application form, application. It, it, it asks number of years residing in the district. I, I think that needs to be more clear, especially now that we're doing district elections, so people might be confused as far as what that means. Does that mean, and since this is going to be in a large, uh, anybody who lives anywhere in Santa Barbara or Goleta may apply. So I would clarify that how many of years residing you mean in the community? In, uh, what do you mean by district? Okay, so we will clarify what we mean by this one. Mm -hmm. Within the district's boundaries, perhaps would be a better way to say that? Probably. I, I would say the district attendance boundaries. Within SBUSD attendance boundaries. Okay, we can mm -hmm. make that change. And then, um, do you have prior experience serving on a governing board, specifically a school district board? Uh, or is that any board, or do you only want them to talk about school district board? I assume that's a question for your colleagues, so I will take notes. Yeah. I would say any board. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So that's one thing, and then so um, oh, Miss Ford, you were going to yeah. I, there, um, I've had experience with advisory boards too. They're very similar and can really mm -hmm. prepare you for this kind of work too. So I'd say governing or advising advisory board. Okay. So any governing or advisory board. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on that one? Not on, on that, that one. I was going to go to the next one. Clear. Go ahead, Miss. Okay. Same spot. Uh, so where it says, have you worked on any school committees or participated? I would ask, are they currently as well? So you may have worked, but are you currently working on, you know, any school committees? Okay. So have you worked on and are currently working on any school committees? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, go ahead. And what was the thinking behind uh, why do we need to know if um, what schools their children attend? How is that relevant? I well, I think since we're asking if their children <coughs> attend district schools, for me that question would be you know. It, good to know just which schools they attend. Are they in a charter school? Are they in an <clears throat> elementary or high school? Kind of a, a general question. Um, any other suggestions? Um, I was wondering why was that, what was the thinking behind that? <laughs> yeah. Any other caveat? I don't know if this is for like an interviewer. Is it possible to ask them like, what do you think the role that the student serving on the board is? Like I want to kind of know what their dynamic with me and with the other students would be. So I don't know if that's something for the application or for the interview, but I feel like it would be worth asking like the value that they see in student voice or, or the relationship they envision having with the student board member. I'm looking around the days. Yeah, I don't I see any opposition. So can interview. you say the, the question again, Kage, that you're proposing? What do you what do you think of the student role or the, the student board member role? Yeah, I think it was for the, they said the interview. It would be a better question for the interview. But um, what do you think the role of the student board member is? And, and what do you envision your relationship with the student board member being like? Got it. So we, if you want if you want to ahead. include it here, I think maybe something to student voice that's a little more general, maybe could be good for the application. Just, you know, do you have any ideas or thoughts about student elevating voices of students or something that gets to the general value of of why we have a student board member? Again, I don't know that yep. we run the risk of making this very long to both 
write and also for you all to review. But I feel like part of the reason our board is so special is because of that student voice that's consistently there. Mm -hmm. and we, I think it's important to make sure that whoever you know is applying recognizes that this is an integral part of our board and it's something that we want to continue promoting. So. Um. I mean, I'm okay with Am that. Am I getting consensus? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, we can I'm go ahead and add that. that. Maybe we can wordsmith uh, it to we'll make it word make more sense. Yeah. something about student voice. Yes. Okay, thank Great. you. Yeah, Ed, I would like to add in here a question because, you know, as I spoke when we started going to districts, wanted to make sure um, that there was some candidate training. I really wanted to mandate that, but we we're kind of close to the 60-day piece, so we can't do that. But I'd like to see it in these questions. What candidate training did you attend? Uh, or did you attend any candidate training? Then they okay. can explain. Because I think it's so critical in terms of getting um, a firm understanding of what this board does. I mean, just simply how the school district works, how school funding works, those different things that you get in training and that gives you the context from you. And then, you know, once you're here and we go to the actual CESBA training, that just further affirms that. But to have that initial understanding is really, really crucial. And I think our district and our students certain deserve us to be the most informed that we can be. Okay. So, so how we can put that in there because that would be certainly something I would be looking for. I will add that. Ms. No. Alvarez and then Ms. Ford. Uh, I, when you're ready to, tra to transition to the notice for publication, I have a couple of comments on that. OK. Uh, Ms. Ford, did you have one for the questions for the interview? I, I do. I, um, at the risk of my tendency to micromanage stuff like this, I just would like to suggest that the actual application could be shorter and some of these questions could go on to the interview because I think the application is the process of trying to find out if someone's eligible for the role and then you can dive deeper with some of these questions in the interview. And um, maybe to Ms. Alvarez's point, we we have said in our governing um, hand, uh, governance handbook that prospective candidates will be given all relevant uh, information about the district. So in a sense, I don't think we need the questions like six and seven and maybe even eight, which are a little bit like quizzes, because if it, we've said in our governance handbook the answers to six, seven, and eight. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I hear what you're saying. I want so to anyway, see I would just say think about all think about those comments. Well, it's That's a board's all. decision. So if, if you're proposing that we take them out and we use them in a different way, or that we handle that differently, I'd like to hear from others. I think this is the purpose of the addressing the the questions in the process. When when I saw this, the first thing I thought is way too long. And when I was reading the question, it seemed more for an interview than an application. So I would be in favor of removing some of those questions, like six, seven, and eight. And those, to me, those are more for the interview than for the application. Because also, I don't want to discourage people from applying. OK. Anybody opposed to that? When you say discouraging people from applying, because of the length of it or the question? Okay. Yeah, it's the length. I mean, like I said, and I'm really familiar with this, <laughs> I've, I've said, I know board, uh, uh, when board members have been assigned. I, I've been through that process many times. And when I saw this, it just seemed really long. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, that clarity piece, because if you look at, I am just was just getting ready to ask that, like, number six, what's the role of the school board in fulfillment of that purpose? What purpose? It's not tying it, just making sure that so is it really the application is the qualify you're qualifying that and then the questions are then further you know um, your answers to the questions are, are supporting your qualifications so this this application be more about your qualifications um, pull some of those and do it in a separate piece okay so we'll pull six seven eight out and kind of make it more about the candidates the qualifications. qualifications and interests in the job than it is about the job itself mm -hmm. yeah okay got it um, if not, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, you have a question about the notice for publication, and I just want to call out that we do have Austin here from our legal counsel's office, because now you're, I think you're asking about this one. Well, what I'm suggesting is that we make it crystal clear. Um, I think uh, we need to specify 
is this term a four-year term? Is this a two-year term? What's the length of the term? Also, to do a little bit of an explanation of the, the person that will be appointed will be for the remaining of the term, and any future election will be by district. I think so that it, whomever applies, they know exactly what it is. So, so my, my suggestion term. is to clarity, 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 where length of the term, mm -hmm. yep. and it's, this is being appointed by at large, and then when this vacancy becomes open at the next um, cycle, it will, be, it will transition to district. District two. District two. Be very specific. That's my suggestion. I'm looking at Austin and he's nodding yes. We got it. We will add that. Good suggestion, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you for that. Great catch on that one. Anything else for the notice? I don't think it's in the notice and I can't figure it out. When I was looking at about receiving late applications, is is this is the part or is that another? I think that's in the directions to candidates. Which one is it? I thought we said we would receive, we wouldn't receive late notices, but then we say like further down that we, it can be considered. I'm looking at the wrong one. On the notice, I'm looking at, um, it says late applications will not be considered. Right, but then somewhere else it talks about. Could it be yeah. in another document it's maybe? It's in, this, it's in these documents. Let me, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not sure. It's about the late something. It seems like then the next um, sentence in that piece, as I'm trying to pull it up. <laughs> yes, yeah, somewhere we talk about the late, but then we have, yeah, consider would not be considered. Then that, I think the next thing, unless we've moved it out of there. <coughs> I'm looking see. at the process. Um, yeah. The actually, sorry, the memo under background under provisional appointment it's stated a little bit different but it says applications received after the deadline will not be considered it's the fourth bullet if you pull up the document call the memo um adriana and it's under provisional appointment it's the fourth bullet So that's consistent, unless you want us to use the same sentence in both places, which we can do. No, I just thought there was a sentence that was in conflict of that somewhere. I don't know where I saw it. We'll look for the... The board reserves the right to waive any irregularities? Yes, yeah, something like that. So, the f On the directions to candidates? Maybe that's it. Laid up. You say we the number one. So number one, directions to candidate. Um, Submit an application. Late applications will not be considered. However, the board reserves the right to waive any other irregularities. Is that what you're speaking to? Yeah. You want us it, to talk more can about that? Be that? A little bit, yeah, explain that. It might be a little confusing because it it's, it will be received late because there was an irregularity, an irregularity or, you know, so just it just struck me different like that. It might be a little confusing. Yeah, did, did, I wonder, did that mean like if an application is incomplete? Or Virginia? Uh, yeah, I'm too wondering what does that mean. I, I, I would suggest that we make it like when somebody's applying for a job, no late applications will be considered. <laughs> on, only complete applications submitted on time will be considered. Uh, I think it's better we just take it out. Because if you like say irregular, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah. What does I, that mean? We, I don't yeah. think any of us know, so yeah. I, yeah. we yeah. could just take that <laughs> yeah. part out. We'll take it out. They take that we'll part out. We'll be uber clear. <laughs> no late applications will be considered. And right. we'll use the same. Um, I know Sonia, Sandra and, and they're taking notes from me. What I'll ask is that we use the same exact sentence in all documents across. Yeah. Thank you for that. Catch. Good catch. Yeah. Completed and on time. Because, yeah, I, I'm all about moving it out, making it clear, because in, in number six, we were just saying that there is time to file a petition, right, against the process. A am I reading that right? Here comes Austin. Thank okay. you, Austin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, the petition is a little bit different. That okay. comes later after you've already made the appointment, and there's a process built into the education code where the appointment can actually be challenged if enough signatures are gathered. So that's okay. kind of a different process. Great. That would be. It's, it's good we move those irregularities yeah. out of there. So yeah. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Thank you. That makes sense. All right. Anything else? Um, we sort of moved between two other documents. So, well, again, we just wanted to make sure we, we covered this, these documents and we were all um, in agreement. We'll make the suggested edits that you've made tonight. And um, that ends this report and discussion. Thank you. Unless somebody else had something. Ms. Capps? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so with that, we will go on to uh, coming events. The yes, can I add that? See. The coming events. Um, I just wanted to announce that the Gateway Education um, Tutoring Center they're ha they're hosting a town hall um, event on October seventeenth from six thirty eight, and our own Dr. Hilda. Maldonado will be a part of that. Um, it's uplifting our youth, uh, looking at special education and the um, within African American students. So we'll be speaking that. On, it is by Zoom, and you do need to register just so that you're uh, able to get in there. What what time is it, Adam? Sorry, six thirty to eight. Okay. It's on Zoom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other coming events, board members? I would like to add one, a couple more. We do have the Combating Anti-Blackness meeting this Wednesday. Um, and San Marcos is having a fall concert October 13th at 7 p.m. Invite all who want to enjoy music to join them. Okay, and now we will go to uh, future agenda items. Okay, so our next meeting will be on Tuesday. Oh, hold on, <laughs> Dr. Maldonado. We don't have it listed here, but we should have the November 1st board study session for budget. Um, oh, under next meeting, coming events under next meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, so the next, Regular board meeting will be Tuesday, October 25th at 5.30. And then the special board meeting um, board study session at on November 1st. And we will go ahead and adjourn at a historic 8.01 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>